Well, good afternoon. It's good to see everybody today. Uh, and welcome to the 2023 Owen Linton Lecture Series. We're glad you're all here. Well, we're in the home stretch. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here these three days. A, a big thank you to the Lovers Lane Foundation and the Owen Linton Lecture Series for underwriting the cost of this awesome event. Uh, a big thank you to the board of the Lovers Lane Foundation who've been here to serve as greeters every day. A big thank you to our musical support, Katie and Jimmy, and then later today, Brandon, uh, for, 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 you know, serving us so well. A uh, big thank you to those working kind of behind the scenes, the people back in the sound booth that make the slides come up at just the right time. I don't know how they do that. Um, to the folks who set up our tables in Watson Hall and our food table and Preston Hollow Catering for providing us, why wasn't that pot roast good yesterday? Um, and a big thank you to our pastors who've prayed for us, read scripture and provided introductions, and today assisting uh, with the great thanksgiving. A big thank you to our senior pastor who arranged for Bishop Signs to be our preacher, our teacher, uh, these three days. And most importantly, a big thank you to Bishop Sines for being such an inspiration to us these three days. And for Maya, I think she's here somewhere. Raise your hand, Maya. There she is back in the back. I, we know you're the support behind the bishop, so thank you as well. It's great to see you. You know, Tuesday we learned about how lovers of God weep. Um, and yesterday we learned how lovers of God withstand. Um, and today we'll um, learn how lovers of God watch. And we'll conclude our service today with the celebration of the great Thanksgiving. So thank you for being here. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Let's get started. I've asked Pastor Jonathan Grace to give us an opening prayer and Pastor, Pastor Kay to read our scripture verses and then Tom Hudspeth to introduce the bishop today. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I know it's, it's kind of strange to think of today, Monday, Thursday, as a good day. You know, it's a rough day for Jesus. And yet, whenever God gathers God's people together, there is so much joy to be had. So now would you stand as you are able and join me as we go in prayer to the God who knows us and loves us. Loving God, we are so thankful for all the blessings that you have given to us, for all the ways you love us and guide us to love each other. We know today is probably not your favorite day of the year, the time of your betrayal, arrest, and great suffering. We read in scripture that today you were grieved unto death. And yet, Lord, knowing what was coming, you chose to wash feet, to break bread, even with the one who would betray you, and to share the good news that all suffering will end, that all things will pass away, but your words will not, that your love never ends. Grow your love in our hearts today, Lord. We ask that you fill us with your spirit. For, Lord, we confess that we often live in fear. We fail to love our neighbors. We are disobedient to you. And so we ask that today at this time that you have given us, that you renew our souls. Prepare us for the unbelievable and overwhelming truth of the resurrection that is coming on Easter morning. We give thanks for our gathering time for the lesson that our bishop is about to share, and for that opportunity to break bread together both at our communion table and at lunch after this worship service. We thank you, God, for walking with us through the horrors of Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, for all the suffering that we endure in this world, and that you always lead us to the empty tomb, to the hope of new life and the resurrection. May we bear witness to the good news of your resurrection, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 
Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, the Gospel of Luke, pardon me, chapter 21, verses 25 through 37. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the seas and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig trees and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap, for it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Every day he was teaching in the temple, and at night he would go out and spend the night on the Mount of Olives, as it was called. This is the word of God for the people of God. Oh, greetings in Christ. My name is Reverend Tom Hutzbeth. I'm the pastor of, of Care and Death Ministries at Walnut Hill Church, a ministry of Lover's Lane United Methodist Church. Now, last November, during the meeting of the South Central Jurisdictional Conference in Houston, Texas, I learned that our new bishop's name is pronounced Signs, which is the name I wish I could have as a pastor for the deaf. <laughs> in preparing for the introduction of our Owen Linton Lecture Series speaker, I learned that the name spelled S-A-E-N-Z has its roots in Spain and Portugal and takes its meaning from the Latin word sanctus, which has been translated as blameless, holy, and saintly. What a name for a bishop. <laughs> bishop blameless, bishop holy, bishop saintly. Doesn't quite go with the high school football coach, does it? No, okay. <laughs> but the pronunciation of our bishop name is signs, which makes for a wonderful introduction for our church's ministry with the deaf, whose language is American Sign Language. And on, on, on February 19, 2023, Bishop Signs was officially installed as Bishop of the North Texas Annual Conference. And during the reception, I taught the bishop and his wife, Mai, the ASL sign for I love you. And then I asked the bishop if we could take a photo together. And I think we have that photo on the screen we could show. So uh, I asked if we take the photo together and then we could show our deaf community. Now there's a, another photo after this one. Okay. Now there, you might think, oh, that's just the same, same photo, but it's not. There's a difference between the two. Bishop Signs is a fast and visual learner of sign language. In the first photo, he had one hand, I love you. But in the second photo, he quickly added his other hand for I love you. Why? Because Bishop Signs told me, I want to show double the love. <laughs> I love that. Let's show double the love. Our bishop signs, who read the signs, teaches the signs, and proclaim the signs of God's kingdom, is the bishop who also signs the double sign of Christ, Maundy Thursday, Mandatum, to love one another as I have loved you. A bishop who gives us the double sign of Christ's interpretation of the law to love neighbor and to love God. 
So may we welcome Bishop Signs with the signs of Christ's double love. Come on up. <laughs> Tom, I, I just I just don't know what to do with it. I'm not used to this stuff. Um, you're, you're gracious. All of you, thank you for your gracious welcome and, and your introductions. As I'm, I ask myself, like, who are they talking about? <laughs> Um, now, it, it's a joy to be with you again this Thursday for the third and final um, talk, sermon, teaching, slash message uh, for this year's Owen Lent Lenten Lectures. It's been such a pleasure to meet so many of you and to have conversations during our break and during our time between here and lunch and uh, at lunch and answer questions that you may have. Um, and to learn about your powerful ministry. Stan Copeland took some time yesterday afternoon and took us into the sanctuary and I asked him, I said, what is the theme for all of the, the windows and the beautiful stained glass? And he says, that's all of creation, the cosmos pointing to Christ. And so we, we were in there and he told me the story of Lover's Lane and how it got started and, and the people that it reached and the lives that it's changing. And um, you know, he told me about all the faithful people that have been part of the legacy of Lover's Lane and all the faithful people that are still serving Lover's Lane and, and, uh, and the openness of the church and the life-changing ministry of Lover's Lane with people not just here but throughout all the world. And I thought to myself, I think this is a church that Jesus would come to if he was in town. This is the kind of church that Jesus, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, so on Thursday... I focused on becoming lovers of God who weep when the visitation of God is not recognized. I focused on becoming lovers of God yesterday when, um, when we need to withstand and care to not stumble in our faith when the world crashes down around us. Psalm 73, if you read it, says, Oh, Lord, I looked around and I saw everybody was doing great and I was in a lot of trouble and I almost gave up on my faith. And if I would have, I would have betrayed your people. And he goes on to say, but you know what? I've come to the conclusion that you hold me by my right hand and in my life and that my life is in yours. And so Psalm 73 is a beautiful uh, um, psalm about a person who's struggling in faith and really contemplates walking away from faith, but the community holds him accountable and he stays connected to God and he realizes that He's where he needs to be despite his suffering and despite the seemingly prosperity of all other people. Beautiful psalm. And today I'll focus on understanding um, how to become lovers of God who keep watch, who stand tall with heads high in expectation of one day being in Christ's presence. Let us pray. Oh God, by the example of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, you taught us the greatness and true humility and called us to watch with him in his passion. Give us the grace to serve one another in all lowliness and enter the fellowship of his suffering in his name and for his sake. Amen. I was struck when I was reading all of the scriptures that Stan Copeland gave me. No. Uh, the part five of Luke. And, and it ends with uh, the people got up early in the morning to go and hear Jesus' teachings. Right? And uh, the Message Bible puts it this way. All the people were up at the crack of dawn to come to the temple and listen to him. All the people got up at the crack of dawn to come to the temple and listen to him. And then you start to, to examine what Jesus was teaching and you wonder, like, why would anybody get up at the crack of dawn to go listen to all that Jesus was saying? There's got to be something behind it. It strikes me that Jesus is teaching about the end of the world, Right? When everything as we know it would come crashing down and the people just can't get enough of it. <laughs> what's, what's wrong with these people? Um, what if everything did come crashing down? Sooner or later. Well, people are strangely fascinated, I learned. Uh, and I know, personally know, with apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic genres. 
set after human civilization's widespread collapse or disintegration due to nuclear war, alien invasion, a climate crisis, or a global pandemic. We, I mean, Hollywood just cannot generate enough of those movies. They're coming out almost every month. Um, the TV and the, the post-apocalyptic genre is simultaneously very attractive to us and horrifying. It, I mean, it, we, we want to watch it and then we don't want to watch it. Like, okay, so what, which one is it? Um, hundreds of TV series, films, books, board, and video games have been created about post-apocalyptic dystopian futures. These futures are depicted as bleak, dangerous, and lowly worlds where spirituality is dead. People spiral into despair, become reckless with their lives, and their only goal is survival and survival at any cost. In the post-apocalyptic movies, factions exist. Find a group or you're dead. The future of our precious little planet <laughs> sure does look and sound like a scary place. The highest grossing apocalyptic movie is the movie 2012. It grossed a worldwide box office total of $791 million. The film depicts the end of the world as predicted by the Mayan calendar. The story follows a geologist discovering that the Earth's crust is becoming increasingly unstable due to a massive solar flare. As a result, catastrophic natural disasters begin to occur, including earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, putting all of humanity's future at risk. The movie follows a father trying to save his family and anybody who could from a falling apart world. Highest grossing film, apocalyptic film. The highest grossing superhero movie set within an apocalyptic context is the Marvel movie Avengers Endgame. Raise your hand if you've seen that. Okay, well, my, my, all my grandkids have, and which grossed $2.8 billion worldwide to date. HBO recently released a new nine-part television series based on the critically acclaimed video game, The Last of Us. The Last of Us is a post-apocalyptic story set in the United States 20 years after a fungal outbreak has turned most of humanity to zombie-like creatures called the infected. The story follows a smuggler hired to transport a young girl across the country to find a group of resistance fighters known as the Fireflies who believe the girl may hold a key to cure the infection. Gwendolyn Foster, a professor of film studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, coined the term apoco-entertainment. Apocotainment. Apocalyptic entertainment. To describe the apocalyptic film and media genre. Psychologists say that the reason that we're so attracted to it is because it helps us relieve our anxiety. I saw how to read that again. <laughs> and the idea is that when you see a world obliterated and you see billions of people wiped out, it desensitizes you to what's happening around you. So when you hear of a tornado wiping out a village and killing 25 people, we say to ourselves, it wasn't that bad. When we hear of a school shooting where children's lives are taken, we say, well, Poor people, but you know, it's not, at least not a billion people. And, and, so, and so apocalyptic literature helps us to get a perspective that helps us cope with the anxieties of the day. I don't know if that's true or not, but maybe. And so it's kind of a, a release valve that, that helps us hear the news and read the papers and get the updates about all the horrible things and not be overwhelmed because we've seen worse, even if it's vicarious or even if it's fiction or imaginary. So when Jesus teaches about Jerusalem's fall, the temple's destruction and the portents to come in the cosmos and the earth, he does not do it to cause foreboding about what is going to happen or what's coming upon the world. On the contrary, he teaches to announce 
the signs of the arrival of the kingdom of God that would reset the order of things. This is good news, or is it? He supports this hopeful promise by teaching about a sprouting fig tree. And he says, when the leaves begin to show, one look tells you that winter is ending and summer is just around the corner. And so also, when we see these signs, thank you, Tom, when we see these signs in, in, in the world, we know that the kingdom of God is at hand. So for, I'm thinking, so the hearers that were waking up early in the morning, like, yes, when can this new world come in? Get all this stuff off of our backs and have a redo, have a restart, have a do things again. It's good news to them. That's why they can't sleep. They're waiting for the sun to come and they go hear more of it. Hmm. Jesus' discourse in the temple during Holy Week about judgment and terrors and cosmic signs or the end of time signaled to the hearers that there is more going on behind the scenes that they're able to see. That's why it's called apocalyptic. It's a revelation. I'm telling you something that you can't see with your eyes, but something's going on behind the scenes of history, and God's up to something. You just can't see it right now, but I'm revealing it to you. Apocalypse. And so, and so God is, is working, as the scripture, God's working from the garden to the garden. Starts, the whole scripture starts in the garden where there's open communion with God and then things go off the rails and then the whole trajectory is we wind up back in the garden. Right? That, that's the whole biblical narrative. And through it all, humanity gets involved and God works even despite human sin and rebellion and God accomplishes God's purposes without people really understanding all that's going on. They're living history but not understanding the history. And so the Gospels put the history of humanity within a broader context, which, which then gives us perspective to know that we're just not here for this brief period of time. We, we're part of, of God's creation. And so, and, so, and so Jesus is talking about, about the kingdom of God at hand. And and it's not about ending things, it's about God making things new. God's new creation cannot be impeded, therefore God's new creation cannot be controlled. And we love to control stuff, don't we? I think that was the problem with the pandemic. We were totally out of control. We didn't know what was going to happen from one day to the next, and we we're totally out of control, and we're not used to doing that. Here's the thing. I've never given birth. Thank God for that. But I've witnessed Maya give birth to four of our children. I've been in, in, in the delivery room for every single one of them. From the time we were in Nacogdoches to the last one we had here in Dallas. And let me tell you something from my observation. That birthing is quite traumatic. When labor and labor pains ring into motion, bringing new life into being, blood and all, and screams, <laughs> um, no one's in control. It's just going to happen. The theme of the promise of God's coming kingdom or the day of return of the absent master is very prominent in Luke's gospel. And we're talking about Luke. I'm just trying to tell you what Luke, I'm not making this up. It's what Luke, in Luke's gospel. Justo Gonzalez says that if every page in Luke's gospel that speaks to the promise of God's coming kingdom were torn out, very little would be left in Luke's gospel. That is how prominent the theme of God's coming kingdom is in the gospel of Luke, he says. But let's be honest. Let's really be honest. Many of us are so entrenched in the present order that the good news of God's coming kingdom is really not that good. Because in truth, we like our lives. We love our lives, especially when we're at the top of the socioeconomic heap. We like it. We benefit from it. No, no matter how much we may love our present life, all things will pass away. That's what Jesus said. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. We don't know when, but God's kingdom is coming, Jesus says. 
And if we are honest, our desire or hope is not for a new creation, but for the present world not to pass away. We pray, thy kingdom come, but just not yet. To that end, I've seen numerous old cars with bumper stickers that read, warning, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. I must admit that I've never seen a rapture warning sticker on the bumper of a late model luxury car. I just haven't. I don't have one on mine. Let me, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I just don't. The, the subsequent theme of God's coming kingdom is not just like all things made new, but, but Luke goes on to say there's going to be a reversal of, of the or, reversal of the order of things, which is further bad news for some of us. Uh, so in the gospel, at the beginning of Luke, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth when she's pregnant for discernment purposes. And when Elizabeth says, who am I that the mother of my Lord comes to visit, Mary breaks off in praise. This is in Luke chapter 2, I think. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. And then she goes on. He has shown strength with his arms. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Yikes. That's not good news. Especially if you're on the throne or you have means. You hear Mary say that, it's like, what, Really? You get the point what Luke is trying to do here? It, it, if you read the gospel, it's like, oh. It, it, it's, if the great reversal of God's new creation is for the poor, for those on the margins, the sinners, the dispossessed, and the oppressed, what Luke says, then where does that leave us who find ourselves, present company included, on top of the socioeconomic heap? The new creation is not good news, if we're at the pointy tip of the socioeconomic pyramid, the very tip, because, because Jesus says the pyramid is going to go like this. <laughs> we're here. That's not good news. So, so, the, so this is troubling. This is really troubling. If all that Jesus says about the coming kingdom and his preferential option for those at the bottom of the socioeconomic heap, what then was, must we do to be saved? That was a question that was posed to the apostles in Acts chapter 2 when Peter goes on and preaches the first sermon and the church grew by 3,000 people. What must we do to be saved? Well, we are who we are. Right? We, we are, we're privileged people. And that's probably not going to change. That's who we are. It's not a bad thing. That's just who we are. Zacchaeus was a privileged person. It wasn't a bad thing. That's just who he was. Nicodemus was a privileged person. It's not a bad thing. That's just who he was. He was a, he was a Pharisee. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man. It's not a bad thing. It's just who he was. Cornelius was a powerful person, centurion of the Roman guard in Acts chapter 10. It's not a bad thing, it's just who he was. So what must we do to be saved? Well, we join ourselves with the last and the least as allies and use our time, talent, and treasure resources to affirm their dignity and humanity as sacred children of God, made in God's image. We can accompany and empower them for self-determination and use our influence and power to do the work of mercy and justice that ensures their well-being. We use what we have for the benefit of those that don't. That's what Luke is saying. We can act like good Samaritans. When we see a need, somebody in need, we help. We use our transportation, our money, and our connections and get the person help. 
says, you, you want to you wanna be right in God's kingdom? Look at your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Love God. He says, uh, we can use our influence and power to, to do the works of mercy and justice. We can, we can be like good Samaritans helping those left for dead by life-robbing circumstances, structures, and attitudes. We can use our wealth and power to undo injustices and advocate for life-giving public and social policies. We can go out to the margins, to the outskirts of society, as one of Pope Francis's favorite sayings, to the people who suffer are exploited and are ignored, like Lovers Lane has over the years. In this way, We'll guard our hearts so that we're not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life so that, so that that day does not catch us unexpectedly like a trap. If we do not guard ourselves, Jesus says, and our souls against the traps and comforts of this life, we may find ourselves gripped with fear and foreboding when worlds crash down around us. And on the outside looking in, when God's kingdom comes, according to Luke's gospel. This is precisely why we must watch. This is precisely why we must stay awake. Jesus calls his followers to be prepared and aware lest we miss what God is up to and what God in Christ calls us to. Look, none of us. None of us want a bleak, hopeless future lacking in compassion. We don't want that for ourselves. We don't want that for our children or our children's children. We don't want that for a community. We don't want that for a nation. We don't want that for our world. And you know why? Because Christ doesn't want that. He told us in the gospel. God's end game. God does have an end game. Not just, it's not about avenging and destruction and annihilation. It's about a new creation. It's about new and abundant life. God's end game is about the way it was meant to be from the beginning for all eternity. That's God's end game. That's the greatest story ever told. In God's end game, we're told God will be with us. God will wipe away our tears. Death will be destroyed. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. Warring nations will be healed. That's the real end game. And perhaps that is why we weep. Because we see the gap between what is and what could be. And it breaks our heart. And we weep. Because we see things, hopefully, from God's perspective. And we weep. We weep because we know we've been created in the image of God and we can do better as a human race. We know we, we, there's something intrinsic, innate within us that we know we can do better. We can be peaceful. We have the capacity to do that because the Prince of Peace has shown us how to do it. We can be generous. We can be merciful. We can be gracious. We can be more loving. We can be more hospitable. Because Christ showed us how to do that. Perhaps that is why we need Christ's strength and help of the Holy Spirit to withstand and not stumble in faith when things crash down around us. Because if we stumble and fall from our faith, then who will keep the light on of Christ's saving faith and grace and healing grace burning for those sitting in darkness and despair. Some of us think, what's the point? Why even share my faith? Why even live for Christ? Because somebody's watching. When you don't think they are, somebody's watching. A word that you say, a decision that you make, a, 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 a way that you behaved in a moment of crisis, somebody's watching. And to that person, you're like the shining. And that's why 
we need to withstand and keep Christ's light shining for those in darkness and despair. We need to keep the light of Christ saving compassion and mercy lit for people with influence so that they can find ways to accompany and serve the last, the least, and the lost with the gifts and the privileges that God has bestowed upon them. So whether we go to Christ or Christ comes to us in final victory, we're to live free of the excessive weight of useless things so that while we wait, we don't get caught up in the words of this life. Instead, we pray constantly that we will have the strength of Christ to make it through everything may come to endure. And because we know how the story ends, we can live with hope, trusting that one day we'll stand before him and feast at his heavenly banquet. That's what our communion liturgy says. Remember? So lovers of God, we keep watch over our souls. We keep watch over each other in love. And we keep watch over the people God loves. We're not gripped with fear and foreboding, even if everything around us and in us is crashing down. We're not dismayed. Whatever betide, God will take care of us. Lovers of God, we weep, we watch, we wait, we will stand. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to receive communion so that we can be sent out from this place as people who love God because of the gap that exists between who we are as a broken society and who God calls us to be as a new creation. Lovers of God who withstand and not stumble or fall away when our world is crashing down because the world needs our witness of the hope that is within us when everything in their world is crumbling. Let us be lovers of God who keep watch and do not get trapped by the worries of this life, striving to be found faithful by our Lord, whether we go to him or he comes to us. As Luke says, in a power with great, in a cloud with great power and glory, in final victory, as we feast at the heavenly banquet. Wow. Thank you, Bishop Sines, for that amazing message, teaching, preaching. Thank you all for being here today. Um, it's been a wonderful three days. You know, it's part of the legacy of Arch and Babs Owen. We were blessed on the Tuesday with Meredith and Jennifer being here, and they're here again today. And Jennifer brought her husband, Arthur, with us today. Uh, yesterday we had two granddaughters and one great-granddaughter of Arch and Babs here. And, and today we have a grandson, David. David, would you stand and be recognized? So before Tom leads us in the great Thanksgiving, a couple of reminders. Um, just like yesterday, we're going to have the buffet lunch in Watson Hall a, a, after our conclusion. It's chicken, parmesan, and pasta this, today, so it should be very tasty. There's a table right outside um, in, in the hall with information about the foundation. Two things we're highlighting on that table is our estate planning minister ministry, where we partnered with Philanthrocorp to provide estate planning services to our members at no cost to you. So if you're interested, pick up a flyer. And we have information out there about the Shepherd's Garden and our columbarium and memorial and naming opportunities. So if you're interested, pick up one of those brochures. And finally, if you take a minute and look at your program on the back of your program, just as a reminder, we have our Monday Thursday service tonight at 7 o'clock in Asbury. 
Tomorrow we have a Good Friday worship service at noon in Asbury and at 6.30 on the Walnut Hill campus. And we have a Good Friday concert tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary and an African Fellowship Easter Vigil Saturday at noon here in Ship Chapel. And I think you could show up almost any time of the day, certainly the morning on Easter and catch an Easter worship service about to start. There's one at seven, one at eight, one at 8.30, one at 9.30, one at 10, one at 11. So, you know, even if you oversleep a little bit, just come and you'll find one. So I hope to see you all here. So thank you all for coming. It's been a great event. Thank you, Bishop Sines, for some very inspiring and appropriate and timely messages um, about lovers of God. When, when I look out and see all of y'all, that's what I see. I see lovers of God, and I'm honored and privileged to be part of this congregation, part of, part of y'all. So, Tom, I'll turn it over to you um, as you lead us in the great uh, Thanksgiving, um, and I'll see you all at lunch afterwards. If you wish to turn to your hymn book, turn to page 12, and invite us to pray our prayer, confession, and pardon. Christ, our Lord, invite to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us with joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you receive the good news that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love towards us? In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And may we say to one another, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And may we offer signs of God's love towards one another. Lift up your heart and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and your Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and came to dwell among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you destroyed the power of sin and death. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us a people of your new covenant. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, blessed it, gave thanks to you, and gave to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, blessed it, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do drink this, and also as you do this, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us, the body and the blood of Christ, that in unity we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And let the people say, Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
Amen. The bread which we break is the sharing in the body of Christ, and the cup from which we drink is the sharing in the blood of Christ. Friends, these are gifts of God for the people of God. All are welcome to receive. This is the Lord's table, and all are invited. We will have three communion stations, one set over here by the piano, one in the center aisle, and on this side we'll have a gluten-free station for those who wish to partake of those elements there.
And we followed Jesus on Tuesday from Bethany down through the Mount of Olives, up the Kidron Valley, overlooking Jerusalem, and he wept because they did not recognize the time of his visitation. Then we heard Jesus' words to withstand when everything seems to be crashing down around us. Today we heard that as long as a God, we're to watch, to care for our souls and to see the world the way God sees it, to be participants and, and ministers of Christ's healing grace and saving words and kingdom-sized vision. Scripture says at the end of Luke, people went home and Jesus went back up to the Temple Mount. His ministry in Jerusalem came to a close. He taught what he came to teach. He got to Jerusalem, he went straight to the temple, cleansed it, and then taught. And taught, and taught, and taught, and continues to teach. We now follow Jesus into the sixth part of Luke's gospel, the Passion. And on Sunday, the seventh part, the resurrection. But today, you're beginning this holy three days with prayer. And so as you come to pray, over the next few days, pray that God will give you the compassion to weep for the brokenness in our world. Pray that God will give you the strength to withstand when the world crashes down around you. And pray that God will give you the hope to continue watching in faith. Would you please stand? And now, friends, may the peace of Christ, the love of God, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always. Amen.